Cotney Attorneys and Consultants is dedicated to helping the construction industry with legal, business, and safety challenges. Welcome to this week's episode of Law and Mortar with John Kenny and Trent Cotney. Hey, this is Trent Cotney, CEO of Cotney Attorneys and Consultants. I want to welcome you to another episode of Law and Mortar. As always, I've got John Kenny, CEO of our consulting group and published author. John, how are you doing? Doing great. It's great to be here today. Everything's good. I know. I know. This is great. It's Friday. Looking forward to a good long weekend here. So I um, want to talk to you a little bit about um, today, a topic that we haven't really hit yet, and um, it's spray foam. And I had the opportunity to sit down with my friends over at SPFA, and we had a, a conversation on contracts, contract negotiation, things like that. And obviously, they're in tune with the fact that there's going to be a lot of money flowing to um, insulation, pr- primarily through what we're seeing from the Biden stimulus package that we anticipate is going to go through. Um, you know, spray foam, obviously, there's, there's a lot of different uses for it, uh, both interior and exterior. Uh, you know, what are some things that spray foam contractors should look out for as far as you know, uh, installation and that type of stuff from your experience? Yeah, I think some of the things that you probably covered them on there that they're facing is, uh, you know, more more moisture, very moisture sensitive product compared to most that are out there. A lot of some of your higher end double part coatings are very similar to having the moisture. What I mean by that, it's not a problem with the moisture, it's just the way it cures. So, you know, again, I think the majority of your contractors, they're all factory licensed that do this type of foam. They're very highly trained. So I think one thing to take out of this for most contractors, this is not a particular product that's meant for everybody. It's a great product if you're trained in that and you're doing it well. Um, Applicators have a special training to go through. I know some of the things we've seen on the roof applications is, uh, you know, uh, you know, moisture getting trapped in. birds pecking at the uh, at the thing, not proper, uh, you know, maintenance on the coatings. They run into, not so much that's the contractor doing it, but the building maintenance. So I, I would say definitely educate your building owner with exactly the type of roof system that's going on and um, how to properly maintain it and only come back and use a qualified, licensed, certified applicator. Uh, and on the insulation, it, ha- it has many uses. I mean, it's a fantastic product for tightening down the air infiltration and the vapor and um, you know tightening the building down so I think you're correct I think you're going to see a lot of money put towards the vertical improvements on that yeah you know I one of the things that I've kind of seen in representing spray foam contractors is uh, there is a, a significant skill level there and um, it's always important that you know you go through that applicator process to make sure that you understand how to put stuff on properly uh, one of the things that I remember we were talking about was you know, the, the need to address, you know, wildlife damage and other stuff like that in your warranties. Uh, and also, you know, design limitations. So a lot of times, you know, spray foam contractors will come into a certain project that's been specced by an architect or an engineer, but then after they're gone, the intended use of the project may change. So it's very important for any uh, spray foam contractor to note that they're not engaged in the design portion that they're doing, they're relying on what the architect or engineer has provided in the event that there is any change in the intended use that they need to be notified before they're continue to honor the warranties. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really think the spray foam industry is gonna explode. I, I think there's a significant amount of opportunity there. Um, and not just that, but a lot of the new product developments I think are really gonna take off under the Biden administration. So. Very exciting time. It was great talking to those guys, and and uh, you know I look forward to having continued uh, conversations with them. Yeah, you know, one of the things I really noted was the level of technical expertise. Um, you know, very skilled skilled craftsmen. Uh, next thing I want to talk to you about, John, was you had a big event this week, and I was able to attend most of it and really enjoyed it. You did a uh, webinar on service, uh, and it was um, the thing I thought was most interesting about it. And I've sat through a variety of service-based webinars in the past. Uh, was you were given a lot of um, what I call 301 level technique, uh, meaning that there was some advanced expert tips on there. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and kind of you know give some um, some of the highlights of, of your conversations? 
Yeah, we, uh, I, I was a very good webinar, very well attended. Um, happy to see the amount of people that participated. We had some great questions on there um, at the end, and we had a bunch of follow throughs answering a couple of, uh, a couple of the highlights definitely were about the, you know, what to expect out of, you know, production as far as crew level, you know, as far as your, your, your crew level in your truck goes. So we covered that. And, you know, as we talked about how, you know, when you're first starting out, you might get about 250 out of a truck, 250,000. And when you get going, you get all up to 450 and above. So your profit margins are extremely high. Um, we talked about the difference of doing a roof inspection compared to a roof survey. And, uh, you know, what we covered on that, to give it a quick highlight, is, you know, roof inspection is something you should get paid for. That's probably something that's not going to lead to any more work. That could be a property owner or a homeowner, whatever you want to go out in. Uh, we'll say, hey, I got so many buildings, I need you to give me an idea of, of what they look like and where they're at. Roof survey, that's, you want to use that to generate business. You're going to go out and look at the project. You're going to give them recommendations for immediate emergency repairs, uh, short-term needs in the next six months or so, and then again, long-term maintenance great way to serve, you know, sell your maintenance plans and programs. So those, you know, usually don't charge for because you're going to generate income off of them. So we covered that. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about a little bit of how, you know, the industry is changing, uh, managing data, using technology and software. Uh, you know, again, we'll be happy to show you. It, it's 50 minutes with 10 minutes worth of questions. Um, anybody here reach out, we'll be happy to share the replay with you. I think I believe you'll enjoy watching it. We had a great response. So those are pretty much the highlights that we, we tipped into. Yeah, I and and look, I, I'm, I'm not a roofer. You know, I, I know more than your average bear, but um, I really enjoyed watching it just to hear the conversation. You know, uh, having you and Lee kind of go back and forth and talk about things. I thought it was incredibly interesting. And it's, you know, oftentimes it's very easy to log on to a webinar or whatever and you're sort of half there and you're, you're not really paying attention. You know, I watched the whole thing and I'm not just saying that, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm your buddy and all, but at the end of the day, I thought it was, it was fantastic. I encourage anybody to catch the replay, reach out to John if you want to see it. So John, one other interesting thing that we had happen this week that I wanted to touch on was we had the opportunity to do some education. One of the things I like to do is outreach, right? And we had the opportunity to provide some education for one of our local governments here on payment and performance bonds. And for those of you that are listening that do commercial work, oftentimes you may get asked to uh, provide a PMP bond, uh, especially if it's a public project, okay? It doesn't matter what state you're in, usually there's some requirement for that. Even if it's a large private job, you may have that, right? So navigating those issues, understanding, you know, how to provide notice, um, you know, the two sides of it, you know, there's the payment side where if you don't pay people downstream, they can potentially claim your bond. And then the performance side, whereas, you know, the owner can come after you if for some reason the project isn't performing as anticipated, you know. So um, very interesting conversations that we had and, and eye-opening from the standpoint of an owner, right? So this was a government that actively uh, does construction projects, large government entity, engages contractors, um, and it was very interesting to hear that side of the fence. You know, John, we're always on the contractor side. Yep, so right. really, really do we get to hear what the thought process is on the other side. One of the interesting things that, that I wanted to convey to the audience was uh, there were questions about when they should trigger the bond, okay? You know, at what point do they get the surety involved? And my response was, and it would have been the same regardless of whether it was owner, contract, or whatever, is do your best to work things out with the, with your, with the other party to the extent that you can. But if it looks like you're not getting any kind of response, that's when you bring the surety in. Now, we all know, I haven't worked with sureties in the past, that it's once the surety is involved, things get a lot more difficult. They get a lot more complicated. Oftentimes, contractors may have personal identification uh, agreements involved where their own personal finances are on the hook. So um, my advice to anybody that is bidding a project with a PMP bond, understand the risk, okay? And, and, and like everything in construction, it's a gamble, but you want to do your best to resolve disputes before getting a surety involved. Once the surety gets involved, they can make things incredibly uh, complicated. They can do that by calling for collateral meaning that they can require you to put down capital to secure the debt. They can hire their own lawyer and then charge you for that lawyer's attorney's fees, right? 
So um, that was my takeaway from that as a contractor lawyer, you know, listening to that. John, I know you're on the other side, you're on the operations side, you know, in the contractor world, what have been your experiences with sureties and do you have any real world advice that you could give listeners? Yeah, so if you're a contractor and you're the one that's issuing the payment bond and it's your uh, neck on the line, as you say, I, I can tell you that you never, ever, ever want to let your surety company be involved in any of your projects. You got to do whatever you can do on your operational side to get it fixed and under control. Um, they're going to get notified if there's a problem, especially if you're doing new construction work there has a bond on it. Most times everyone wants to just cover themselves and they'll do it, but you have to manage the process. If you allow your bonding company to manage the process, it goes just to what you said. It's going to cost you a ton of money. And you're right. You could also still be paying fees after the work was done and don't ever want to get in a position where someone else comes in and does your work either. And then on the other side, if you're a contractor being brought in, this is through my experience to do someone else's work through a bond, be very, very cautious on that as well. Um, if it's a project where the contractor is completely defunct and out of business, that's a little bit different thing. You can kind of negotiate up front and do it. But I, I've known some contractors over the years that have gone in and been involved in projects like that where a contractor is still actively in business and you got a whole other set of mess as far as the company, you know, as far as relationships and getting things done and getting paid. Again, that's not the legal advice that you just gave. I'm just telling you from an operational standpoint in your company, it is an absolute nightmare if you don't control the process properly. All right, that's, you know, that's, that's some good advice. And anytime you are the cleanup contractor, you can expect to be a witness, okay? So that's something you gotta factor in into it is if a contractor got kicked off a job for whatever reason or is defaulted, you know, and you come in to clean up or finish a project, you need to bid and anticipate that you're going to be spending some time in the courtroom. Um, so it's it's always a difficult uh, position to come to be in if you're uh, in either position, whether you've been kicked off or you're coming in to, to fix things. John, one other thing I want to mention today, and this ties us into our questions. So as the listeners know, we always uh, try to answer one of the questions. We do have a backlog, so we may have to increase this at some point, but... <laughs> Um, the question today uh, involves OSHA, and the, the question in particular was, what do I do if OSHA comes out to a job site? Okay, the question was by Jason. Um, this is interesting uh, from my perspective because just this week I, I spoke to the Washington Roofing Association, our call, on uh, their state plan OSHA, and we talked a, a lot about this. And one of the things that, that I always recommend is that you have an SOP in place for when OSHA comes out to your job site. Okay, Whoever's in charge of that job site should immediately call the home office, the safety director, management, see if the inspector will give that person an opportunity to get out there um, before the inspection starts, and then make sure that that person understands their rights. So generally speaking, if you are a supervisor, an officer, a director, management, anybody with supervisory authority, you don't have to speak to OSHA unless you have a member of management present and management's council present. So you have that right and often, you know, it, it, you're not told what that right is. So it's important that you understand that um, before you start the inspection process. Uh, there's a variety of other things that are out there. We try to constantly educate on knowing and understanding the ins and outs of inspections and citations. But John, from the contractor standpoint, you know, what are some things that you would recommend if OSHA shows up at a job site? How would you handle it? I mean, what are what are some common sense type things that you can impart to our listeners? Well, one is I have to completely agree with what you said as far as as a company, you need to have an SOP in place. It's almost like doing a fire drill when you're in school. You should train with your employees exactly what it's going to be like when OSHA shows up to your job then that way, one, they're more comfortable when it happens because it's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's an inevitable fact that they're going to show up somewhere along the line. And I've always found when, whenever I've had foreman on site or, you know, it's usually going to be your foreman. Most of the time, your supervisor and up, unless he happens, he or she happens to be on the job when it happens, it's going to be your foreman. And also, uh, you know, have your lead man ready too. You know, sometimes a foreman has to be in a meeting 
Sometimes a foreman may be at, you know, doing something else. So have them train. What I mean, found by that is that they're more comfortable and easier to be prepared for when it happens. So it's not like a big shock. I mean, that's a tip. Other than that, you, you got to be polite. You got to teach your guys to be courteous. And, and you know, it, it's just part of life that happens. I mean, you're not going to be able to run in a fire drill and correct any problems that you have. Hopefully, you've done all that ahead of time. And I give a little chuckle on that because I've seen that happen before where they clear the roof and throw up on there and everybody's over trying to move you know, uh, barricades around and different things. But, you know, it's too late at that point. So you're better off stopping. And, and again, I always recommended that the foreman still notify the home office of what was going on. Even if you were confident, your people were trained well enough to continue on with that inspection and then get someone out there. You, then, you, then from there, it's get your ducks in a row and, and be prepared. Yeah, that's, you know, that's some great advice. And, you know, generally if OSHA's out at your job site, you don't want to keep doing work because it's just a matter of time. It doesn't matter how safe you are. All it takes is one photo, one, you know, one second, and it could be, be another potential violation. Obviously always tell the truth, always cooperate, but know your rights. And that's, that's what we're saying. So, with that, John, we've talked about a lot today. I'm going to end it there and uh, want to let the uh, listeners know that if you've got questions for us, please ask. We answer them. As you can tell, we're, we're getting through them and we, uh, we value your input. So you can reach me at tcotney at cotneycl.com. John, how can they reach you? That's uh, jkenny at cotneycl.com. Great. And we appreciate you guys. Stay tuned next week for another episode of Law & Mortar. See you then.